Welcome to The Loins of History, a podcast connecting the past to the present and correcting historical and political inaccuracies. I'm your host, Colin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay. Today is going to be a great episode. So as you know, we've been talking, uh, our new series is on the fall of empires, and we spent the past three episodes discussing the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, now we're going to go to one of Rome's contemporaries, and it's probably an empire you haven't heard about, the Han Dynasty in China. And I'm really excited to hear what Jay has to say as he leads us through the fall, the rise and fall of the Han Dynasty. And I think it's going to be really informative, especially for all the Western listeners out there who may not as be as familiar with Chinese history, despite us having a series on uh, some of Chinese history uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. So with that being said, Jay, can you, can you give us uh, give us some of your key takeaways and what you want to talk about with the Han Dynasty? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Colin. I Do you remember playing an old video game called Dynasty Warriors? Did you ever play that game? V- vaguely. You know what? Vaguely. So there was like these awesome characters like Lu Bu, Yuan Shao, Cao Cao, uh, Zhang Zhang Fei, <laughs> Guan Yu, Liu Bei, like all these great uh, characters that make for an awesome video game. I spent a whole lot of time as a kid and as a teenager playing on PlayStation, these various, there's like several iterations of this game called Dynasty Warriors. And that is the time period that we are going back to uh, for this episode. The whole story uh, uh, is called Romance of the Three Kingdoms by uh, a dude named Luo Guangzong. And... uh, yeah, he wrote this book called Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and it is a classic that all to, that today all Chinese males are actually required to read. And and the PLA, kind of taking us back to our last series, the PLA is actually required, uh, or, or sorry, more PLA, People's Liberation Army generals, quote, Romance of the Three Kingdoms more so than Sun Tzu. And his art of war. I, I was about to say that. I was like, that's almost like the American military. If you, if any of you have friends or have been in the military, you know that like the art of war is thrown around in just about like every military branch. It is, and now it's. And for those of you in the corporate world, you're starting to see it, it eke into the corporate world as well. But it's funny that it's mm-hmm. in China that Romance of the Three Kingdoms is more widely proliferated amongst the PLA. That's right. Uh, and not that Sun Tzu isn't, because he, he definitely is, but uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms and just is just a fantastic uh, story. And I highly recommend, um, if, you, if you want to get the closest thing to a unabridged uh, version, I forget the publisher, but there's like a really popular two-volume uh, publication. The only problem is it's in the old Wade Giles spelling, so the spelling is kind of different than which than the uh, opinion uh, that's out there today. Uh, but if you want a single volume kind of abridged version, Penguin Paperbacks publishes a good single volume, and it's in it's in the in the more common spelling for all the names and stuff. So, uh, but that's the period we're going to be talking about the fall of the Han dynasty. And the reason why I chose looking at the fall of the Han dynasty immediately after we talk about the fall of the Roman empire is because like Colin said earlier, they were more or less contemporaries. So the Han Dynasty began around 206 BC and it lasted to 220 AD. So a little, you know, you know, shorter than the Roman Empire, about 400 years roughly. Um shorter than the Roman Empire. However, it was, you know, roughly uh contemporaneous with uh Rome and Secondly, it's it's interesting to look at, you know, people were interpreting the fall of Rome immediately 
during and after and for centuries to the present day, interpreting why Rome fell, kind of, you know, trying to see who to blame, see what went wrong, see what needs to be done better in a Western context. In the same way, in an Eastern context, the Han dynasty is one of the more popular uh, uh, dynasties to look at what went wrong, what happened um, from an Eastern standpoint. And one of the things that I wanted to look at here in, in this series is like, okay, we've got the Western example, the Western ancient example. Let's look at an Eastern ancient example and see if there's any kind of different perspectives. And without getting too far ahead of myself, uh, I think there are. There's actually some really interesting um, takeaways, uh, primarily because of Confucianism, and, and we'll get there here in a second. Uh, I wanted to kind of start start off this introduction of the Han Dynasty before we talk about why it fell uh, with a quote that in in a really interesting way kind of sums up both what was going on at the beginning of the empire, in the middle of the Han Empire, and kind of towards the end, and how uh, in the same way that... Uh, you know, Augustine was in his book, The City of God, was interpreting the fall of Rome. Like he was trying to provide an explanation for, you know, a theological and biblical, a spiritual explanation for what was going on. Uh, Luo Guangzong uh, was kind of doing the same way, the same thing, but he was, he was very far removed uh, from uh, like, I think almost a thousand years uh, removed from the fall of the Han, and he did so through a story. Uh, instead of a theological treatise, he did so with a narrative. And, he's, and he has a great quote, uh, and he says, The empire long united must divide. Long divided must unite. This is how it has always been. That is one of the opening lines in his Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and it kind of sums up nicely this very Confucian and Chinese view of not just the Han, but how all civilizations rise and fall, uh, unite, divide, uh, and almost kind of brings this fatalistic, inevitable aspect to the unity and disunity um, within within the Han. I feel like that uh, has some applicability to today. Yeah. Long, yeah this would... The United States has divided briefly uh, mm. in our past. And now, it, as we mentioned in the previous couple episodes, feels like it's kind of tearing at the seams again. So it's interesting that he even made that observation so long ago about a completely different culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's this, it's this fundamental belief that nothing lasts forever. Right. Uh, it's just a question of how long is it going to last? Um, yeah. And, and specifically as we'll kind of see the story here with the Han dynasty, you know, the Han uh, was founded um, by a former sheriff, like the dude was kind of, uh, you know, Liu Bang was more or less a nobody in this random area. And the Qin dynasty before the Han was the first dynasty that, to unite China, uh, hence Qin and China. Uh, that's where, uh, you know, etymologically, that's where we get the name China from, is from the Qin dynasty. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like China was united for the first time and they lost the mandate of heaven. And we'll, you know, we've talked about the mandate of heaven in previous episodes. We'll do a brief recap in this one. Uh, and this guy, Liu Bang, was like, I'm going to rally the common people and we're going to form an army and we're going to take political power. And, I'm going to say that I have the mandate of heaven and bibbidi boppity boopity dynasty. <laughs> it works just like so, that. Basically. So, <laughs> that's interesting. Is that from what you've done, from the research that you've done, and this is more of a question, I guess, on expanded Chinese history with the mandate of heaven. Is that because we talked about it kind of with um, the Qing dynasty falling where there is fractured 
it was a fractured empire. There was a lot of external pressure. And basically, I mean, there was a lot of a groundswell of populism, political parties with the communists. Well, at first it was, um, it was not the communists, but it, but you get what I'm saying? It was kind of like this response, like, oh, the Qing dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven. We are no longer going to, they are no longer in charge because they have lost the mandate. Has that happened not only with the Han and the Qin, but other dynasties as well throughout China? Oh, yeah. And what's interesting uh, is this is very much a a result of Confucianism. The The reason why historians interpret the rise and fall of the different dynasties in this way is because this is kind of the metaphysical world that Confucius created. Um, and yeah, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. Uh, but when we, when we get to the Confucius part, it'll, it'll all make sense. <laughs> um, Yeah, so kind of beginning with the end in mind here, in 220 AD, right? So Rome still exists. Uh, In 220 AD, a dude named by the name of Cao Cao Pi, uh, he was the son of one of my favorite characters in all of Chinese history, uh, the warlord Cao Cao. Uh, He was Cao Cao's son. And Cao Pi forced the last Han emperor, a guy named Emperor Xian, to abdicate abdicate, uh, the throne uh, in favor of Cao Pi. And Cao Pi proclaimed himself emperor or Huang Di in Luoyang, uh, Luoyang, the historical capital of the Han Empire in the year 220. And that effectively was the end of the Han Dynasty. So over the course of the next uh, this episode and the next few episodes, uh, we're going to look at answering four basic questions about what happened uh, in the Han. We want to ask the question, how? Did the Han fall, which is is kind of the first and the easiest question to answer, precisely because the the sources tell the story uh, primarily um, of of how the Han fell. The second question is why did the Han fall? Like, what were its causes? Uh, what were the things? You know, we talked about you know social disunity. We talked about class struggle in the Roman Empire. We talked about um, you know, emperors and the Praetorian Guard and the debasing of currency. And we talked about those economic factors and cultural factors, etc. Uh, we want to kind of ask the same question here for the Han. Like, wh- wh- why did the Han fall? What happened? Third question, what is the significance of the fall of the Han? Uh, if y'all have been listening to a few of our episodes, you've heard us say like, uh, you know, Colin, I firmly believe that if the history is not relevant to today, the history is kind of pointless. Um, that's kind of a kind of a hyperbole, um, but it's intended I would, to be. I would better say that all history is important. You just have to, rather than knowing historical fac- facts for its own sake, knowing those historical facts and being able to apply it to what's going on today is important. Even minor details in let's say medieval history, like the clothing, it's something very minor. But if you're able to attach that to a few other larger, more macro kind of level ideas, and that's just a piece of it, and you're able to connect that through to say like, I I don't know why the French and the Germans have always had a historical rivalry and why that's a, a, applicable today or why the mandate of heaven is important. And, you know, there's all these names and figures and they did certain things, but why it's important. So even though they might be small facts, if you're able to connect them to something much larger, I think it is important. I think historians tend to get lost in their, in the facts of history and they forget why they need to learn in the first place. Yeah. Facts yeah, are important, that- but you just need to know why you, you, you need to be able to tie them to something. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And it 
that's why one of the explicit questions that we're going to kind of come back to over the next uh, few episodes is what is the significance? Why are, why are two Americans talking about the fall of the Han dynasty in 2023? Man, we've talked a lot and, about China lately. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's significant, right? Like there's, um, there's lots to talk about and it is a, you know, it's the second most populous country in the United or in the, in the world. And, um, yeah, there's literally everyone in the world knows kind of like in the United, you know, with the United States, it's like, if you want to do business, you need to be talking to the Americans. Uh, China is, you know, kind of up and coming in that, in that regard too. Like, uh, China is one of the biggest, fastest growing markets. So it's China is v- significant for sure. Uh, and the last, the last question and really kind of the, the pinnacle question that I want us to be asking here is, are there any lessons to be learned, right? Uh, from the fall of the Han. And I think, you know, by the end, as we examine all of these different empires and civilizations that have fallen, collapsed, divided, etc., uh, we should have a pretty good, uh, you know, meta perspective of what causes uh, these civilizations to collapse. What can we do about it? What can we learn from it, etc.? cetera? Uh, I wanted to throw, before we kind of get into an overview of the Han, one disclaimer out there, kind of looking at the different sources. Um, all, of the, all of the original sources are obviously Han Chinese, right? Nearly all of those sources are Confucian. And and we and they interpret the fall of these dynasties through a Confucian lens. Um, I say that as a disclaimer because Colin and I, like I said before, are two Western white dudes uh, living in 2023, and we are not Confucian. Uh, even though I can read a little bit about Confucianism, that doesn't make us Confucian. Uh, so there's there's somewhat of a disclaimer there to say like. You know, we approach these historical case studies from a Western philosophical, logical lens that the sources that we're using just simply don't have, and they're not approaching their own history with those same things. I hope that that allows us to have, uh, to kind of create this, um, uh, you know, this synthesis approach where we, uh, you know, generate lessons learned that are actually unique and can um, but maybe look at our, use the Confucian lens as a different way to look at our own society, uh, kind of as a disclaimer there. Okay. Moving on to an overview of the Han, and I've and I've kind of mentioned some of these details, so I'll I'll go through this part relatively quickly. Um, the Han Dynasty lasted for about four, roughly four hundred years, uh, and it's actually helpful to compare the Han uh, Han China to the Roman Empire in a few ways. The first the first way is that Rome was primarily a seafaring and mercantile uh society right with rome being literally and basically the 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 center of the mediterranean sea uh the just merchant classes um you know the economy was huge um you know seafaring uh, was was a large aspect of the culture and the society in its expansion was driven in large part by the Mediterranean. Um, Rome was able to expand all over the Mediterranean Sea and only had mixed success going beyond the Mediterranean. You know, for example, it made it all the way to Great Britain, but yet it couldn't go into the heart of Germany, right? It made it through modern day France, what was Gaul, but then like they repeatedly got schwacked by the Germans uh, in, and that was difficult. Same thing in the Middle East, like they were able to go all the way to, you know, modern day Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Egypt, etc. But then you start going too far out in Persia, uh, too far away from the Mediterranean, and it was very difficult to project power. <clears throat> 
So Rome was primarily a seafaring Mediterranean society. Han China, on the other hand, is a continental power. However, it was an agricultural society that was um, beholden to two main rivers, the, the Yangtze and the Yellow River. The Yellow River is kind of the cultural and societal heartland of really all of China, kind of northern China. Um, these both of these rivers flow out of the, of of an area called the Tibetan Plateau, which is an extremely elevated, flat, and dry area where the higher up the mountains, the snow uh, creates these rivers flow through the arid areas in Tibet and and pour out in uh, China uh, along these two rivers. The Yellow River uh, is the main river that we'll kind of focus on here because uh, it's also known as the Sorrow of China because it carries all of that uh, silt from the Tibetan Plateau. It's prone to, you know, over time, overflow its banks. And there have been many a many a famine where, you know, these agricultural villages and cities would spring up along the Yellow River, but then there would be like these natural disasters and, you know, anywhere from thousands to hundreds of thousands of people would literally either die or lose their livelihood because the Yellow River over overflowed its banks. Um, so we have a, you know, Rome became an urban mercantile Mediterranean seafaring society, whereas Han China was primarily a rural agricultural, uh, continental, uh, society. And because of that, um, China was was relatively flat in terms of its political structure. The, <clears throat> uh, there, there were like various administrators, uh, that were given, given, you know, kind of like this feudal concept. Uh, there, there are phrases, Duke King, um, prefect these uh provincial governors um uh were given these areas to kind of govern and then they reported to the emperor um they're the ones that provided the protection for um uh for the different clans the different villages so that they could do their rice paddies you know graze their cattle etc in peace and everything would be okay Interesting. That's very that's very different than most, if not all, Western empires. But in the flat, in the sense that, like Rome was very hierarchical. Like the military, the political makeup, just the society in general was like within Roman society. Most people know about the plebes versus the patricians. Like, was there any sort of class distinction, like in Han China? Or is it just sort of like, hey, you had a little bit more, you had a little bit more rice, so you're a little wealthier? Was there like a clear line? So there were there were different classes. Uh, there's, you know, you you could think of there being like a gentry, like a landed gentry. Um, there were, you know, more up to do. The, the reality is, and kind of what we'll get at here in the Mandate of Heaven, is that in the same way that in, in the United States today, if something goes wrong, it's very common for people to go, like, when gas prices go up, Republicans go, this is Joe Biden's fault, <laughs> right? Like, we made, we made a very quick jump from me, regular old citizen, to blaming the president of the United States, right? Uh in the same way that when the Yellow River overflows its banks, the you know the peasant would say the emperor is unworthy to maintain the mandate of heaven, and this is you know this is heaven uh, punishing us for ha- being ruled by unworthy governors. That's what I mean when I say flat. Uh, it's not that there isn't a hierarchy in a social structure because there absolutely was. It's just 
it's just to say that when things were going bad, people people jumped to blaming the emperor very quickly. That makes sense. So it was more like today. So it honestly be something a little more like we're familiar with today, like yeah. Joe Biden's look at look at Joe or look at Trump. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So whereas I think in the Roman Empire, that definitely was not the case. Like there were there were you know, in in Israel, there was there was kings <laughs> who were who were ruling over there, and there was like this way to petition. Um, you know, there was a senate, like there was somewhat of a division of power. Whereas um, in in Han China, and really in all of the 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 dynasties in China for quite some time, it was pretty quick. Uh, there wasn't like a supreme court and a senate and a legislature. And then, you know, an executive branch, it was like the emperor. The the, bu- the bureaucracy of Rome uh, kind of shielded the emperor to an extent. To an extent, kind of yeah. helped and hindered, but he created layers of protection that you had to go through. Got right. it. Okay. So that makes a lot more sense. Interesting. Right. Um, another aspect now we'll kind of, as I've alluded to it several times, well, it's important to talk about the religious aspect because – uh, in, in by religion, I mean what's not a religion, and that is Confucianism. <laughs> um, to understand, when looking at why the Han Empire fell, we we need to know some things about Confucianism, because you know, in the same way that religion for us here, really all over the world, uh, and Confucianism in China, it provides the framework f- through which we kind of see existence, right? Like we kind of, it's our explanation for these, you know, ethical considerations, these political considerations. Um, so we need to know some things about Confucianism. Uh, the main, one of the main things about Confucianism is its emphasis on social harmony, uh, which in many ways radiates from the family. So one of the core tenets of Confucianism is this concept known as filial piety, which filial piety is essentially the reverence and the respect that children owe their parents, primarily their father. Uh, and this is and this is not this is actually quite extreme. And, uh, you know, in traditional Chinese uh, families, even today, it is expected that children more or less serve their parents and serve their father um, in in all these different ways. And, of course, like, the, you know, it, it's different from, from family to family. But Confucius taught that uh, the, a, a good society was a society with rightly ordered relationships. Um, there's, there's a good quote from a book called the Analects, uh, that says the Duke of Jing of Qi asked Confucius about government and Confucius replied, there is government when the prince is the prince and the minister is minister when the father is father and the son is son. And what he's saying is the government, you know, this political structure is true. Like it is, it's the way that it's supposed to be when the right people are in the right relationships to all of the other people. The prince is the prince, the minister is the minister, the father is the father, and the son is the son. When those things are rightly ordered, there's harmony and things are the way that they are supposed to be. Uh this is uh, I th- I th- there's been some really interesting work. Uh, hopefully, I can find it and maybe put a put a link in the in the description. Uh, but there's been some really good work recently uh, that's talked about how Confucianism is by definition an authoritarian uh, uh, system, and in that way is kind of incompatible with more democratic or individualistic. Um, uh, you know, views of of the world. Um, another thing about Confucianism is, at, you know, kind of as a religion, 
per se is its emphasis on orthopraxy as opposed to orthodoxy, which orthopraxy is the emphasis on correct practice, whereas orthodoxy is correct belief or correct worship. So here in the Western tradition, especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you know, we focus on right belief, like there is one God. Uh, and you must worship him. Or in the Islamic tradition, like there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, Whereas in Confucianism, it's less about correct belief and it's more about doing the right thing. Like you are supposed to show deference to your father. Um, uh, this This is important um, because we'll see here in the in the fall of the Han, we'll see that even though there were people who were kind of seeing the mandate of heaven pass from the Han, these regional warlo- regional warlords very much had to keep up these appearances of doing the right thing by showing deference to the emperor as the emperor. Uh, and you know the like for example the tv series for the romance of the three kingdoms it starts a roughly 30 years prior to the han emperor actually abdicating so it was like there was 30 years when these people with these various warlords warlords were the de facto rulers of china and they still paid deference to the han uh uh, because that was the right thing to do. Like in today's China, how like is that still the case? And how if so, we talked a little bit, kind of talked a little bit about it with um, Xi Jinping. How do they? How does the Chinese government manipulate and kind of use that now? Because it feels like that's never gone away. Yeah, and um, I guess briefly, you know, we've talked about in in previous episodes when. Mao proclaimed the People's uh, Republic of China in 1949. He basically attempted to get rid of Confucianism, uh, and he saw it as this old imperial vestige that needed to go away. Well, Xi Jinping has actually brought it back. And one of the reasons I think that he's brought it back is it accords very nicely with authoritarianism, like I said. Uh where it's like you are ethically like wrong if you don't show respect to your betters. Like if you, you know, this rightly ordered relationships, uh, you know, the party is the party. You, you know, regular Chinese person. It's almost like you, they're the child. They're the child. The government's correct. the parent. And it's like that correct. relationship. Like you serve me. I know best. You take care of me. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So one last thing on Confucianism here that's important to bring up is, so there's five texts, five like core texts that kind of explain what Confucianism is. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but the, the one I am going to go over is called I Ching or the Book of Changes. And the Book of Changes is where we get this idea of yin and yang. I'm sure a lot of Westerners have seen the symbol of yin and yang. Uh, although, Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't actually think that symbol comes from this book, but I could be wrong there. Um, but you know, Confucius envisioned the world as an interaction between these two forces, yin and yang. Uh, and yin and yang, you can think of it as like positive and negative. You can think of it as unity and disunity. Uh, these two opposing, complementary, mutually reinforcing, mutually disintegrating forces um, that kind of just swirl in this wheel of time aspect. Uh, and that is the foundation of existence. Uh, it's definitely this metaphysical... Uh, belief that we are fundamentally in this conflict between good and evil type deal. Uh, this is this is important to bring up because in our you know in the in the Luo Guangzhong 
quote in the beginning, we see here the empire long united must divide, long divided must unite. This is how it always, this is how it has always been. Uh, we kind of see here that when we interpret the fall of the Han dynasty, we kind of see this fatalistic uh, aspect. Um, it's not, it's not true fatalism, but this deterministic aspect of, um, you know, this is going to happen type deal. And this is the yin and the yang in, in their, in their struggle. Uh, and with that, so kind of moving on now to the mandate of heaven. And we've talked about this in previous episodes. Uh, listeners, if you really like the China stuff, I highly encourage you to look at uh, our 20, 20 plus episode series on U.S. and Chinese relations. You know, we focus a lot on the Qing dynasty and, uh, you know, how the mandate of heaven kind of impacted that. And we, and we talk about the mandate there a lot. So I'll cover it briefly here, but essentially the mandate of heaven was this popular belief that heaven, uh, which is the, the Chinese word is tian, um, gives this legitimacy to worthy rulers. And when unworthy rulers uh, come into power, it's taken away from them and given to a worthy successor. Uh, some of the main ways that uh, the mandate of heaven is interpreted is obviously in power, right? Like if if a central government or a central emperor is having de- uh, having issues maintaining power, um, you know, it could be thought that the mandate has has been removed. Uh, another way is through uh, natural disasters. So, kind of going back to the Yellow River, if the you know, if the Yellow River is overflowing its banks or if there's famine, something like that, bad weather, um, you know, they'll begin to question whether or not the mandate uh, has been taken. Uh, and that's a that's a good segue uh, kind of kind of going on to um, one of the one of the final points that I wanted to cover in this episode. And that is the correlation between natural disasters and disease in the and rebellions to the loss of the mandate of heaven. And essentially in the in the fall of the Han dynasty, not I don't I kind of want to save uh the details, you know, uh in our next episode, but for the purpose of right now. Uh, there were a few key events that that happened beginning in the uh, 170s AD that kind of led to the Han losing their grip on power. Uh, the first one was uh, the yellow, or the first one that we'll cover, not chronologically, but the first one that we'll cover is the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Uh, the Yellow Turban Rebellion was led by the Zhang brothers, uh, and they were of Taoist inspiration, although they were kind of wonky Tao- Taoists. Uh, they they were not Confucian. Uh, they were Taoism was seen as a as a uh, competitive system to Confucianism. They believed in healing. Uh, they believed in like miracles and uh, some other stuff. And they believed that a new day was dawning. Uh, where righteousness would fill the earth at the hands of these Zhang brothers and their followers would wear a yellow band around their heads and they were called the yellow turbans. Uh, this was a massive uh, peasant rebellion in northern uh, in northern China. And, and we'll kind of go into more details later uh, in, our, in our next episode. Uh, but this really shook the Han dynasty to the core and it served as one of the main impetuses for for their eventual uh, downfall. Uh, secondly, is you know between the one seventies, the one eighties, and the one nineties, the Yellow River overflowed its banks quite a bit, uh, and there were uh, millions of peasants that were displaced to the southern parts of of China along the Yangtze and elsewhere. And essentially what that did is it basically created high unemployment. And when you can think about high unemployment, high unemployment means crime. Banditry was a thing. Um, in this time, uh, 
there's a there's a fantastic uh, Chinese classic called Water Margin, where it's essentially this Robin Hood story of where the bandits are, um, you know, doing doing the right thing to, um, you know, bring justice to the common people. Uh, which was Chairman Mao's favorite book, I believe, was Water Margin. Uh, so banditry was a thing, and uh, obviously, you know, just starvation if your rice paddies get washed away because it was overflowing its banks like the food food supply goes down and that's not good uh so and then lastly uh between 171 and 185 ad there were like six or seven plagues (laughs) and a lot of them were related to wait for it colin the antonine plague there's uh there's Evidence that shows that the Antonine Plague, which was basically, I think I was reading, it was smallpox or like a variation of smallpox. They they think it was some kind of pox because it's hard to, that's the problem with going through a lot of these historical diseases because you're reading symptoms and a lot of times it's historians saying these things decades later. But the Antonine Plague, they think it was small, a form of pox. Because they were having pustules on the back of people's throats. They were vomiting. There was lesions on the skin that they described and intense fever. So, yeah, very um, very pox-like. But it's interesting you say that because it seems that most diseases in the timeline you just gave, it kind of makes sense. They seem to flow kind of along the Silk Road, kind of yep, this east to go. west. Maybe yep. by kind of it, it's how fast it, ta- it travels, maybe – 20, 30, even a hundred years, but eventually it'll make its way to the, to the West. Um, yeah, no. And that is, it's funny you say that. Cause that was on the, on the Han Chinese side, the records show that it was like, Oh, we actually think this is where the Antonine plague came from. Uh, and, and just for our listeners, the silk road. So silk, was an industry invented by the Chinese and it kind of flowed from, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese silk plantations, uh, to, uh, the trade would go through Tibet, like through the middle East, uh, and would, and would hit the Mediterranean and, which what was the Roman emperor that like came out wearing like a silk robe and like all of a sudden silk like became super popular in Rome? I don't know. I sh- I feel like I, I, I should was, know that, but there was an emperor. Yeah. Um. So yes, the Han Chinese oh, and Rome yeah. did in fact trade with one another. I was going to say uh, there was a. This is not even Rome related. There was Marie Antoinette came out in a, um, a hot. I, I don't know if it was. I don't remember if it was silk. Or it was wool, but she got in a lot of trouble because she came out wearing what was supposed to be kind of like a peasant's outfit. And, um, you know, she obviously classed it up, but it like crashed part of France's economy. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, because they, they, like, they were known at the time for making very ornate and royal clothing. And when the queen comes out and she's wearing, like, oh, she's wearing clothes just like us, but it's a little fancier, like, crashed the textile industry in France briefly. So totally unrelated to anything we're talking about, but Hey, quick question. So you said, what were the dates you just mentioned for when they, this plague that they think was the Antonine plague came about between 171 and 185 AD. It's interesting. Um, There was, there's a report and they're, they're trying to cross. I was reading through it a little while ago that an envoy from Rome made it to, Han China in 166 AD. Nice. And it'd be kind of interesting if like they kind of hung out there for a little while and somehow they, they were the ones that brought it back 20 years, <laughs> you know, they brought yeah. it back. Cause you know, it's like, like your kids in daycare, like you, oh you know, your kid gets something, then they recover, then they go back, but yet they're still contagious and they give it to another kid. And it's just like, you keep trading it, trading diseases trading back, back and, and forth. forth. <laughs> yeah. Sharing the love. <laughs> Oh, anyway, that was I, I totally derailed us. No, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah, so there were these these plagues uh, related to the Antonine Plague, and it's you know if you like I said before, like in the same way that we look at our gas prices and go, this is Joe Biden's fault. 
if three out of five members in your family die from uh, pustules in the back of your throat and you go, the emperor has lost and all of a sudden uh, lost the mandate of heaven. And all of a sudden these, these dudes named Zhang show up and they're like, we can heal you and we'll make sure your disease goes away and we'll actually control the yellow river. Like we'll build these dikes, like we'll build up these walls, like uh, we'll make sure the yellow river stays like we'll do our thing. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And the, uh, the emperor all of a sudden loses a, uh, a lot of prestige, if not the mandate itself. So uh, all of these things kind of add into what brought Han China down. Um, I think we'll, in our next episode, we'll kind of talk through uh, the the big things in the romance of the three kingdoms, like we'll talk about the Yellow Turban Rebellion, we'll talk about the eunuchs in the palace corruption and the court intrigue. You know, we talked about the Praetorian Guard in our previous episodes, but like it's the same thing, or at least very similar, where um, you know these various power brokers within the capital kind of start abusing their office and where they start making decisions to benefit themselves. They're not really thinking about the people and the people start getting upset. Uh, if that sounds familiar <laughs> to anything going on here. <laughs> By the way, before I ask you a question, um, mm. it was Emperor Elagabalus. So I, when you said the Roman emperor that wore silk, I was like, that was probably Elagabalus, but I didn't know like off the top of my head, but then I just, I just Googled it and he was the first one. And it would make sense because he was also like a cross dresser and did a whole bunch of other things that was wildly unpopular with Rome. Uh, but he was the first one that wore silk. Yeah. Well, no, not really. He <laughs> caused a lot. Of, there's a lot of pain and suffering and uh, hmm. a lot of chaos. But um, anyway, Question I was going to ask you. So, could the Han, and this may be something we discuss more of the next couple episodes, but could the Han Chinese have kept the mandate of heaven? Is there any way with all of those natural disasters that they could have kept it? Yeah. So, it's funny. I, I guess, one, that's a good question. And in the same way that we kind of look back on the Roman emperors and we say like, man, if they weren't so cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, uh, like maybe Rome wouldn't have fallen. And that's true. Like, I think the primary characteristic of what was wrong with the Han emperors and really any emperor is weakness. It's, it's, it's kind of seen as like this, and this is super like oversimplified explanation, uh, but it's, it's less about like they made the bad decisions and more about they were not strong leaders. And that creates a power vacuum. And we'll see here like the yellow turbans rise up, the eunuchs rise up, and then the warlords rise up. Uh, and we kind of get this succession of, um, you know, the, the, the last emperor was a child. I think he was nine years old when Dong Zhuo uh, made him, instead of his older brother, uh, the emperor, uh, and, you know, a nine-year-old is not going to be a strong personality in a court. Uh, and he spends the next, you know, uh, 30 years basically as a slave in his own court to these various warlords, Dong Zhuo, and then Cao Cao. Uh, and then Cao Cao's son, Cao Pi, was the one that uh, uh, got him to abdicate. So it's like, if if there had been a strong emperor or to, you know, turn things around maybe. Um, but I guess, you know, kind of similar with the emperors of Rome, like when you kind of inherit these offices or you, you just paid, you didn't really have to do anything to, to get an office. Like it just, it, it leaves you very quickly for sure. Uh, to summarize here, we kind of talked about like, Okay, we're looking at why a dynasty fell, um, and we're asking the questions, 
how did Han, how did the Han dynasty fall? Why did the Han fall? What is the significance of the Han fall? And can we learn any lessons? Uh, we talked about who, who the Han was. We talked about how they're primarily a continental and an agricultural society um, that was kind of beholden to these two main rivers. And uh, we talked about Confucianism and its impact on uh, kind of how the Han Chinese saw their place in the world, how they see it's this, you know, the world is this conflict and this struggle between yin and yang, how they focus on right practice instead of uh, right belief, uh, and how, uh, you know, justice is rightly ordered relationships. Um, we talked about the mandate of heaven, uh, and we talked about what it looks like to lose the mandate of heaven with rebellions and famines and disease and natural disasters and war, which is where we're going to go in our next episode. We'll talk about, uh, you know, the details about the yellow turbans, the eunuchs and the various warlords that rose up, uh, and with their standing and independent armies, uh, to seize power from, from the Han. And then we'll kind of, you know, synthesize that all together and talk about what we what we can learn uh from all that all right i'm really excited jay you know it's we talked a lot about modern chinese history in the last series but i think this is going to really this is just something that i don't think I, i personally haven't studied a lot of and i know a lot of our listeners probably haven't either so it's going to be it's going to be something, it's going to be a learning experience. So I'm looking forward to you taking us through that. Um, you know, with that being said, uh, for our listeners, we appreciate you and your support to continue listening. Um, if you want to give us a follow on social media, uh, we're going to start being a little bit more proactive on social media and posting some uh, different informational things on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, And we're even on YouTube as well. You can catch our podcast on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast, Podcast Addict. Uh, If you could give us a rating, I noticed we have a few more ratings, um, especially on uh, Apple Podcast. And we'll give you a shout out if you give us uh, not only a rating, a five-star rating, but then also a comment, uh, especially if it's constructive. So we do appreciate that. And and I guess it helps the algorithm. But, um, you know, it is good just to hear back from the listeners. And if you do want to contact us, our we do have an email for loinsofhistory at gmail.com. So we uh, we do respond via email. If there's any episode ideas, questions, or anything like that that you have for us, we happy to interact. We do, we've do we done it a few times, and we like to interact with the listeners and uh, answer your questions that you may have. So with that being said, thank you for your time, and see you next week. <laughs>